Hello. Welcome to the Beginner's Peak Away Game Dev Stream. Um, today we're going to be figuring out how to make games in Peak Away. This is for anyone who uh, wants to make Peak Away games. We're going to talk about today what Peak Away is. We're going to talk about how to use it. We're going to try starting to make a game in it. This is just one part of a long series that I'm going to do, teaching people how to make Peak Away games. I'm doing it because I love the Peak Away community, uh, and I want more people to come into it. I think it's a really good way to start uh, making video games, uh, because Peak Away gives you kind of everything you need to get started. The one thing it doesn't really give you is there aren't too many good tutorials out there right now, so I figured I would do this. Um, so let's get into it. So the first thing we need to go over is we need to talk about what is Peak Away. So let me switch over to my beautiful pink background. Do do do. And let's just take a look at what Pico 8 is. So Pico 8 is a fantasy console. And you can find it just by typing in Pico 8 in your web browser. And this is the official Pico 8 site. You can, if you want to buy it, it's $15. I'd recommend you do that. Um, if you're a student, you can maybe also get a license for it. Uh, but this is the place where all the Peak 8 things happen. This is where you go, you just type in Peak 8 and it's the Lexa Laffle forums. So basically, the whole idea behind fantasy consoles is um, a lot of people enjoyed the restriction placed upon them by when they had to make old school games, like Game Boy games and stuff like that. Like, you only had so many colors to use, you only had so high of a resolution. It was a creative challenge but it also meant that you got stuff done because you couldn't you couldn't like pack your game full of everything you needed to release it at some point because you had all sorts of limitations that you couldn't go above um, and those limitations bred a lot of creativity so rather than today making Game Boy games which people still do people are still hacking away making Game Boy games and the development of Game Boy games and things like that are really rough like you really need to be a computer scientist to get into that. Um, rather than do that, some lovely people created fantasy consoles, which are sort of like modern day video game consoles that have a lot of uh, a lot of tools that make it easy to develop games, but with some artificial limitations placed on them so that you get some of that creativity from restriction that old school games had. So for the Pico 8, um, if you've ever looked at the Pico 8 before, you get a 128 by 128 screen of 16 colors. Uh, you only have four channels of sound. You only get, uh, let's see, seven, eight different sound voices. Um, you can only use the D-pad and two buttons. So you're restricted in a lot of ways, but if you can swallow building a game with those restrictions, it's a really good environment to build a game in. Bum, bum, bum. This is the Pico 8. So uh, if you open up your version of Pico 8, this is what you'll see to start. It's a command line with not much on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, and if you want to switch over to, if you want to start like getting into the meat of it, the best stuff is hidden behind. If you press escape, it will toggle over to the editor view. And this is where you build all your games and such. Uh, so you have at the top, you have these little tabs. You have a tab for code. You have a tab for tab for sprites. You have a tab for map data. You have a tab for sounds. You have a tab for music. And these are all the little editors that you're going to use to build your game. So Pico 8 includes everything you need to run Pico 8 games and everything you need to be able to create Pico 8 games, which is really nice. So I think the best way to kind of get a sense of Pico 8 is let's just type splore into the command line. I press escape to get back to the command line. Um, Pico 8 has tons of tobes. Uh, so if you if you enter in Splore, it'll enter it it'll enter into the special thing where uh, it's kind of like this viewer that finds games for you. So there's the Lexalawful forums where people post all sorts of games. 
Let's go back there. Do do do. P equal eight. Let's go back to the forums. BBS. P equal eight. And we can see if we click cartridges, we can see cartridges that people have posted onto the forums. You can see Celeste. They prototyped it in Pico 8. And if you click any of these, you can just play it in your browser. Let's do it right now. So Pico 8 has the ability to export games to the web. I don't know what this game is. It's beautiful though. Well, I did a good thing. Looks like you're building trains. Looks like a fun game. Uh, so people post cartridges to the Pico 8 forums all the time. And those, anything you post in the forums, automatically get entered into Splore. So you can see here under the new games tab, you can see the game that I just played. And I can run it. Shinkasen by Fuchiko, Fuchikoma71. And I can play it and Pico 8, and still not know quite what I'm doing. But I think I'm doing a good, good job. Nope, not doing a good job. Uh, so if I reboot, we're gonna get a fresh start on Pico 8, and we want to build some games. So let's start with this. Let's make a new directory. Let's call it Pico Beginners, and let's go into it. So mkdir creates a new folder, cd uh, moves into that folder, ls tells me what's in this folder, which there is nothing right now, dir, yeah, dir tells me what folder I'm in, if you want to know what the commands are, you just type help and it tells you some of the commands, um, ls, cd, mkdir, these are kind of like standard terms that are used if you ever used a terminal before. And we should, let's create a new file for our game. Let's say the game one. And let's load up game one. Let's type run. And it doesn't do anything because we haven't built a game yet. So if we press escape, we're now editing game one. This is our little coding interface we can type in here, but we need to type, type specific stuff. We need to type code. If this is your first time coding, uh, Pico 8 uses uh, the Lua programming language, or maybe it's a scripting language. So if you want to know about the syntax, you can just look up Lua syntax, and if you want to know the Pico 8 specific things, you can look up Pico 8 syntax. Pico 8 has three main functions. We have an init function, we have an update function, update, and we have a draw function. This, under the uh, underscore update function, will be all the code that updates the, updates the game state. And I'm using double hyphens because that's a common, it's code that doesn't do anything and I can write whatever I want. And anything in the underscore draw function will, that's where all of our code related to drawing things to the screen. Boop, boop, boop. Well, let's do the same all the code that draws draws things to the screen game loop uh so pico 8 runs 30 30 frames per second which means this underscore update code will run 30 times a second and then this underscore draw will be called right after that 30 times a second init all the code that happens when the cart is first run cart meaning cartridge which is uh, Pico 8 vocab for game. So we have these three functions, and this is where we're going to plop all our code, either into underscore init, which happens once when the game is started, underscore update, which is where all of our code that should happen every frame, 30 frames per second should happen, and underscore draw, which is where all of our drawing and rendering code will happen. So if I want to draw things to the screen, let's do rect. 10, 10. 150, 68. So rect is a function that uh, draws a rectangle to the screen. So I want to see a rectangle 
8 means red. I'll be talking about that in a bit. Let's just, I'm going to do control S to save the cart. And I'm going to press escape, go back to the command line. I'm going to do run. And you can see it did draw a rectangle. And it actually drew it kind of like near the upper left corner of the screen. And it's more wide than it is tall. And the reason for that is when I typed this rect here, 10 comma 10 refers to the upper left XY position of the rectangle. 10, 10 is 10 pixels from the left hand side of the screen, 10 pixels from the top of the screen. And then these two refer to the lower right corner of the rectangle. That's 100 pixels from the left side of the screen and 60 pixels from the top side of the screen. Pretty much all game rendering uh, uses the upper left side of the screen as a reference point because that's when that's the point that windows are typically resized from. Um, and then 8 refers to the color red. So if I were to change this to 12, that refers to the color blue. And you can see if I run the game, which I just did by per pressing Control r you can see there's a blue rectangle in the same position. But I don't like that whenever I run this cart, it displays a rectangle on top of the command line. That looks ugly. I want to, before I draw the rectangle, clear the screen. And then if I want run that with Control r now I'm drawing a rectangle, a blue rectangle. Uh, but before I do that, I'm clearing the whole screen. And something you might not be able to see is this is actually running 30 times a second. So 30 times a second, the computer is clearing away the whole screen, drawing it black, and then drawing that rectangle there. And clearing it away and drawing the rectangle, doing it over and over again. Which is kind of wasteful at this point because we're not doing anything with it, but that's okay. Let's talk a bit about what a function is. A function is a... A function is a bit of code that does something that you want to do. And rect is a function that has code that knows how to draw a rectangle. And I tell it what type of rectangle I want to draw by passing in things to the arguments of the rect function. So the rect function takes basically x1, y1, x2, y2, color. And then if you give it all those arguments, it will know how to draw, draw a rectangle from this x1 x1, y1 position in the upper left to this x2, y2 in the lower right and this given color. Let's annotate draws a rectangle. Clears the screen. And then similarly the, the CLS or clear screen function um, knows how to wipe away everything that's drawn to the screen and we don't need to give it any arguments. It just knows how to wipe away the screen. It doesn't need any further information. So that's sort of like what a function is. You can write your own functions. Like if I wanted to draw, if I wanted a function that's like super rect and it took in, let's say, x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, z2, color. Woof, color, color. Um, I could write my own function and then I could write code that code that draws a super rect. Whatever a super rect is. Probably a cube is what I'm referring to because there's a z1 parameter. So let's just say let's just say cube. Draws a cube. And in order to draw a cube, I would need to fill out this function, but I'm not gonna do that right now because we don't need to draw a cube at the moment. So I'm just gonna delete that. But goes to say that functions are a code that you can run easily and pico8 comes out of the box with some pre-built functions uh, and you can write your own if you want you might be confused by this 12 thing that 12 refers to the color blue uh, the way the way you might want it to work is if i want to draw a blue rectangle i would give it like the x and y coordinates and then i would just be like blue Draw it blue, please, or draw it red, please. That's not the way peak weight works. The way it works is you pass in an integer number, and then that refers to a color from 0 to 15. And if you want to know which color it refers to, you can go over to the sprite sheet editor. 0 refers to black, 1 refers to navy blue, 2 refers to purple, 3 refers to dark green, 
4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 is red. 9, 10, 11, 12. 12 is blue. 13, 14, 15. So 12 is blue. And I pass in 12 here. I should get a blue rectangle. There you go. And if I want to get an orange rectangle, this is the ninth color up here. So I can just pass in a 9. Doop -a -doop, and I get an orange rectangle. Hooray! Uh, let's talk about some other drawing functions. I can draw a circle. So if I draw a circle at point 4040, let's say, x and y position of the circle, those are the first two arguments. The third argument is the radius of the circle. I'll do 10. And the last argument is, again, the color. Let's draw a beautiful pink rectangle. That would be 14. This is the 14th color. Doop, boop, boop. And if I control R to run the code, I can see I'm drawing a pink circle there. If I want it to be bigger, I can make the radius bigger. Doop, now it's bigger. Right P set is another make it pink, make it all pink. We can make it all pink. Oops. Unexpected end of line. So uh, I tried to run my code and then it did this syntax error line 23, unexpected end of line. If I go back to my code, I can see it's talking about line 23 here, if I put my cursor over it. And I can see that it's an error because I tried to call a function and didn't do anything with it. Uh, so this is a syntax error. I wrote bad code. It's like if I wrote, computer, please draw a triangle. Computers don't know what that means. We need to use a language that computers can understand. So. That's why this is not proper syntax, but this is. So pset is another function that just draws a little dot on the screen. It sets a pixel to a certain color. So if I set, let's say 10, 100, to let's do another pink pixel. Oops, what did I do? Eh, I don't know. Um, so pset is a function where you pass in the x value. So I passed in 10, which should just be 10 pixels from the left side of the screen. Uh, I passed in 100 for the y, which should be towards the bottom of the screen. It's 100 pixels from the top. And we're dealing with 128 by 128 pixel screen. So it should be all, almost all the way towards the bottom. 14 again is pink. And if I run it, oh, I see my little pink pixel there. So great. So these are kind of like our raw drawing functions. Let's, let's annotate them. Doop, doop, doop. draws a pink circle. Let's make let's make it blue again just so we have some variety. Sorry, I know pink's a good color, but uh variety is a good color too. Doop, doop. And let's make this yellow. Which which is yellow? So eight, nine, ten. Let's make it a yellow pixel. Doop, doop, doop. If we wanted to, another drawing function is rect fill, which draws a rectangle but fills it in. Let's draw a green rectangle. It's going to be okay. Let's draw it near the upper right corner of the screen. So let's draw 80 pixels over, 10 pixels from the top. Uh, let's do, let's make it 90, 20. So it should be just a little tiny square. Let's make it green. What is green? 8, 9, 10, 11. Or we could do this dark green, 0, 1, 2, 3. Do, do, do. There we go. We have a little green square. And similarly, there draws a filled, filled green square. Do, do, do. Similarly, there's circ fill. Circ fill. There's, let's see, line x1, y1, x2, y2, color. Circle, X, Y, radius, color. So that's a good start. We have a game where it's just drawing a bunch of stuff to the screen, but that's at least something. What I want to do, though, is we want to have a game where you can actually play it. Let's have a circle that moves around the screen in response to button input. And let's have that. Let's say that that's our player. So if we want to, if you want a player to move around the screen, we need to store an X and a Y value so that when the player is moving horizontally, they're changing their X value. When they're moving vertically, they're changing their Y value and they're just a little circle for right now. So what I need to do is I need to declare some variables. 
and um, functions are a little container of code that you can run easily. Variables, which are defined with local, are a stored value. So a variable could be set to a string hello, or a number 5, or 5.2, or negative 5.2. So variables are sort of like, if you've ever done some math stuff, they're sort of like that. You're saying x equals 5, and then you're playing with it a bit. Uh, so I want to start my player in the very middle of the screen, which this is a 128 by 128 screen, so the very middle would be 64, 64. Underscore init is the right place to do this. This is all the code that happens when the card is first run. And I'm saying that at the very start, I want my player to be in the middle, so I'm going to say player x equals 64. Player y equals 64. Let's make this a little bigger. So we're setting the player x and the player y to 64 to start. These are just variables. They don't do anything. We can choose whatever we want to name them. We could say pumpkin x or whatever we want. Let's just do that. Let's make it pumpkin. Pumpkin x. Pumpkin y. There we go. So we can name them whatever we want. Let's draw a little circle at pumpkin x, pumpkin y. I already know that circ is a function that takes an x and a y, a radius, and then a color. Circ fill is very similar, but let's do, instead of setting a specific x, y position where we want to uh, draw our pumpkin player, we're going to pass in those variables player y. Whoops. Pumpkin x. Pumpkin x. Pumpkin y. Um, that's the same thing as passing in 64 comma 64 because that's what pumpkin x and pumpkin y are set to. But the cool thing about it is we can change those variables and it will change where the circle is going to be displayed. We don't need a variable for radius. We can just set a radius of like let's say 10. And we if it's a pumpkin, it should probably be orange, if everybody's okay with that, which would be none. Draws a cute little orange circle. Do do do. So now if we run this code, control R, we can see there's an orange circle in the middle of the screen. Lovely, that's our pumpkin. It's a little big, so I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna lower the radius to six. Let's try that. Smaller pumpkin now, there we go. And if we wanted to change the variables that they get initialized to, if I want the pumpkin to be more towards the left side of the screen, I could change pumpkin X, and then it's drawn more towards the left side of the screen. I could change it, 114 will be more towards the right side of the screen. And now the pumpkin's drawn on the right side of the screen. We've made some good progress, so I'm going to save with Control S. And you can see that it's saved into game one. If I load game one, that's all of our code. Good to save often, either by pressing escape and doing save, whatever your file name is, or just Control S. That's what I typically do. But I want my pumpkin to start in the middle, which it does. Now I want the pumpkin to move around when inputs are pressed. So uh, Pico8 uses the Z, X, and arrow keys on a keyboard. I want whenever you press the right right arrow key for the pumpkin to move right, left arrow key to move left, same thing with the up and down arrow keys. And we're going to want to put that under the underscore update function because that's code about updating our pumpkin's position and then underscore draw will handle drawing it in the correct position. The way we do this is if button zero, then put pumpkin x plus equals one. So what this code does is button checks if some, some button is pressed. I forget which index corresponds to which keys on a keyboard. But if whatever button zero is, if it's held down, which is what the BTN function does, checks to see if a button is held down, then we're going to increment pumpkin x by one. Pumpkin x plus equals one, which means 
pumpkin x equals pumpkin x plus one. It's just a shorthand plus equals. Okay, so Charlie says one is right. Thank you, Charlie. So now if I press control R to run the code and I press the right button, my pumpkin moves to the right. Yay, farewell pumpkin. But I don't just want to move right, I want to move all the directions. Checks if right arrow is pressed. Move right. Checks if left arrow is pressed. Do do if button zero, then pumpkin x minus equals one. So pumpkin x refers to the number of pixels from the left hand side of the screen. So if we decrease that amount by one, it will be going more towards the left. If we increase that by one, it will be, be going more towards the right. Do, do, do. Move left. And I'm going to copy this code. And we're going to do the same thing. Two is up. Three, two. We're going to do the same thing to the Y direction. If you press if you press the up arrow, your Y should decrease. Checks if up arrow is pressed, move up. If we press the down arrow, then we want to increase the amount of pixels the pumpkin is from the top of the screen, which be incrementing or increasing pumpkin Y. Move down. Checks if down arrow is pressed. Boop a doo. Save our code, control S, run our code, and now a pumpkin moves around the screen with the up left right down arrows. So this is kind of like uh, all the code that moves our pumpkin. Do -do -do. And then down here in the underscore draw function you can see draw our pumpkin. You can see this is the code that actually draws the pumpkin on the screen. I have a little bit of trouble with the Pico 8 editor, the code editor in specific, because even now it's getting a little unwieldy. And we haven't written that much code, but like it's easy for me to scroll past stuff. The lines are long enough that I need to kind of like scroll horizontally to see all of them. Uh, so if you want to build a game entirely in the Pico 8 code editor, you totally, totally can. I want something better. I want to edit this in a... Again, Canon? No. No, Canon. No, we're not. I'm not giving you feedback. Because the feedback I'm going to give you is that my scanner's light broke. So now when I scan everything, it's just pitch black. And that's not cool, Canon. More to the point. I want to edit this code in something where I have a little bit more, I can see a little bit more of the code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type folder and that will open up the folder where my code is saved. So you can see game-1.p8. This is the code that we're working on. I'm going to open it up in Sublime, which is my favorite code editor. And now you can see if I edit something in this file and just run the code it'll say loading external changes which means that pico8 can pick up the the changes that i uh, make in sublime which is this text editor now i have all this breathing room because i'm editing my code in sublime which is a much more robust text editor um, i can see more of the code this is what i do whenever i'm working on a game i pretty much do this instantly as i just move everything over into sublime you can see that there's some headers that weren't there. If we look at the code in Pico 8, it doesn't have all this junk that is in Sublime. That is because the .p8 file that I have loaded here isn't just the code, it's the entire game, including um, the Lua code, the sprites, the sounds, etc., etc. We've only added code, so that's all we see here. Another thing is, if I make a change over here, like if I set pumpkin x to 14, and then I go over here and I set pumpkin x to 74 without loading first. Now we're in a little bit of a weird state where if I save my card over here, Sublime has to update to what was saved over here, which means it blows away my changes to setting this to 14. So 
If you want to use an external editor, just be careful. You can lose changes. Just be kind of rigorous about when you're done working in one. Like if I'm done changing code in Sublime, I save it and then I come over here and I load my code again. I think it's a really good idea to use an external editor. Just be careful. I don't want you to lose code. So we're drawing a pumpkin. It moves around the screen. It's basically a video game as is. We have all this code that draws things. These are functions that draw rectangles and circles and pixels. It's all really great. But I want to draw pixel art. I want to draw some, like, actually draw something and then have it be able to plop it on the screen. If we click this little Space Invaders head, we can move over to the pixel art editor. And this is this is a pretty pretty good tool for making pixel art. And what I can do is if I click these. I find a color I like, like pink, and then I click this little marker here. You can draw things to, you can draw things. And you can see that I'm drawing in here and it's drawing in this slot. And if I move around here, I can draw in different slots. And what these slots are, these are sprites. You can see which sprite you're drawing in. I'm drawing in sprite 19 right now. Um, you know what we should draw? We should draw a pumpkin, because that's what we've been working with. And I'll have a little stem poking out, and I'll have some shading on the stem, and I'll have those little pumpkin lines. That's a great pumpkin. So this is this is all well and good. We're drawing cute little pumpkins. It's very fun. I'd encourage you to do it. Uh, but we want to put these in our game. So you can see this pumpkin here, the orange pumpkin, is 004. You can see the pink one is 005, and the, the blue one is 006. Much like our colors have indices, like this is black is zero and uh, red is eight. So do our sprites where our, our orange pumpkin is four and our pink pumpkin is five. So much in the same way, we can use that to draw our sprites to the screen. So if we go back, we can see that uh, in Sublime, my text editor of choice, you can see I have this new section of the screen, GFX. What the heck is that? That looks very scary. It's actually very simple. I told you that uh, the .p8 file included all of the cartridge, code and graphics and sounds included. The way that Pico8 saves files, saves .p8 files. This weird block of text that just showed up. This is our pixel data. It's actually, it looks scary, but it's actually very simple. Uh, you can see there's lots of zeros. That's just where there are black pixels in our sprite sheet which are, you can see there's lots of black pixels here, which is here, and then right here, there's this gray here, which is the fifth color of Pico8, and you can see there's fives here. Do, do, do. So every pixel in our sprite sheet is just a character in our .p8 file, where the fifth color of Pico8 is just a five here. The You can see blue is the twelfth color, and we don't have... Uh, there, there isn't a 12 here, but there is a C, which in hex code is the 12th uh, character. Hex code is, if you think about doo -doo 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 -doo, all of the characters we have, this is the character 0 through 9. And if we wanted one character to represent 10, we could use A to represent that. And if we wanted one character to represent 11, we could do B, C, D, E, F. So... This is kind of how Pico8 stores a blue pixel as C, is C is the 12th symbol that it's using. So it's really simple, and if I wanted to, if I wanted to change this to, let's say I wanted that this little butterfly's body to be dark green, green is the third color, I could just change these to threes. And then if I load it up, you can see that my butterfly is green now. So we have this pumpkin sprite, sprite number four. We want to draw that to the screen. Let's go back to our code. And much as we have circ fill, which is a function that draws a filled circle to the screen, let's use the spur function. And spur stands for sprite, which is the word Pico8 uses for these little eight by eight pixel areas of the sprite sheet. It's a common word in game development. So if we draw sprite 4, which is the pumpkin sprite, and we draw it to, let's say, pumpkin x, pumpkin y, this should draw a pumpkin. And let's just 
load our game and run it. Now I'm a little pumpkin moving around the screen. So that's dope. But let's talk about, let's do sounds. Let's do some sounds. So if we go to this little volume box thing here, we can go into the sound editor, which is another built-in tool that Pico8 has. And if we press tab, there's two views the Pico8 uh, sound editor has. You can do tab to see kind of like a more chiptune-esque way of doing it. Press it again to see kind of like a way to just enter in a sound as a waveform. If I were to just draw like this, what I'm doing is I'm drawing a sound over time. And this, uh, how high each of these is, is the pitch. So if I were to run this with spacebar, cool. So you can here go up in pitch and then down in pitch. And if I drag here and slow this down, this is one way to enter in sounds in peak rate. You just draw a waveform. Another way is you can press tab and you can just kind of like type on your keyboard like it's a little piano. Depending on what you're doing, if you're writing music, you probably want to go into this view and kind of like type in whatever song you've composed. And if you're making a sound effect, like maybe you want to use this view instead. Up here, you have the different waveforms that Pico8 supports. So let's, let's, let's compare these. So this is a little bit of a sawtooth sound. And this is the sine wave. So you can see there's kind of a difference in the texture of the sound. And then this one is a, a straight up sawtooth waveform. Let's try this green one, which is a square wave. This one is a reduced square wave, I believe. This is a more rounded off one. I forget, I don't remember. This is just noise. And then the last one is kind of like a, I think a combined sine wave. It sounds kind of bell-like. So these are kind of like the voices you have to make a sound out of. Great. Uh, if So this would maybe be like you collect a coin or something and it makes that kind of sound. So this little thing here takes you to different sounds. We're in sound zero, much like we have sprites and this is like sprite four and sprite two. We're right now in sound zero. If we go over, we can be in sound one and we're gonna play sounds in much the same way that we drew sprites or checked for buttons or drew colors. So let's make a sound that's like a drum beat. And if I were to just like draw a very low sound, we're gonna have it be a low white noise sound. That doesn't really sound like a drum beat yet because it's going on too long, so I'll up the speed. That doesn't really sound like a drum beat yet either. So what I wanna do is I want the volume to vary over time. I want it to be loud at first and then drop in volume. So I can edit that here. That sounds a little bit more like a drum beat. And you can see when I was editing this volume slider here, it was actually changing this blue column here. So the columns are, this is the pitch in the note. So which note you're playing. This is the octave it's in. So this is first octave and you go, go all the way down to zero, all the way up to four. This is the voice you're playing. So You can hear the different voices of the sounds and then this is the volume and then the last column is effects effects add a little bit of pizzazz to each of these notes so if i wanted it to right now if i play this it just sounds like one long held note if i wanted to sound like separate beats i could apply let's see this effect which is a drop beat if i type in five slow it down so five for every note that has the five effect applied to it the pitch will drop which makes it sound like individual notes or maybe it's the volume eh, it's hard to tell if I wanted to do let's get rid of those effects if I wanted to have a wobbly sound I could apply effect two two is an effect that makes it kind of wobble in and out I forget what that's called but maybe you can hear the difference Right now it's going wah, 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 wah. and if I take that effect away, it just sounds very flat. These are the effects you can play with. It's zero through seven that you can apply here. And they make the sound sound differently. 
So that's kind of like a quick overview of how to make sounds in Pico 8. So let's make a let's let's do our little let's make our little sound. Do -do -do -dee. Let's take away that effect. I like the I like these to be the individual bump bump bump. And let's fade out the volume here. So now we have like this could be like a one up sound effect. And it is sound effect number two. I'll just save that and I'll go back to my code. And if I scroll down, you can see there's an underscore sound effect section in my .p8 file. And much like how each uh, symbol here represents a pixel in the sprite sheet, each symbol here represents like a choice we made over here. And if you wanted to crawl through all the symbols that are here, you can kind of figure out what each symbol represents and toy with it there. It's a little harder to kind of see than the pixel art stuff, so I'm not gonna do that. But we've made a sound, and I want to play that sound. Let's play that sound if we push a button. Let's go back to play a sound when a button is pressed. If button 4, then, I believe button 4 is Z, check, checks if Z is pressed. Then, sound effects 2. And that's all we need to do. So if the fourth button is pressed, which I believe corresponds to the Z key, then play sound effect two, which is that sound effect we just made. Let's just save and run our code. So you can see it works, but if I hold down the Z key, it kind of stalls out. And that's because every frame it's checking to see if Z is pressed, and if Z is pressed, it's playing Playing a cute little ditty sound effect. Sound effect. So I don't want to play the sound whenever button, whenever the Z key is held down. I want to play it just when you first press it. There's another function that checks to see if a button was pressed this frame, and that's BTNP. So this checks if button B is pressed this frame. And actually, these are inaccurate. This checks to see if button, if those keys are held down. Doop -a -doop. Um, so now, if I run the code and I press Z, now it plays that sound effect, but if I hold it down for a little bit, it doesn't kind of stall it and play it every frame and override itself. But we have a little pumpkin that moves around, and if we press Z, we get a cute little sound effect. One last thing I want to do for this stream is... If we have pumpkin X and pumpkin Y, we could do like pumpkin color, pumpkin color, and we could say pumpkin color equals, let's say we wanted to draw a red pumpkin, and do -do -do, we only have this orange pumpkin sprite, and it would, it would be kind of inefficient to make all these sprites for all these different colored pumpkins if we imagine there's going to be a lot of different colors. So I don't want to make another red pumpkin sprite. I just want to take this orange pumpkin and make it red. So what I'm going to do is, before we draw um, our pumpkin, I'm going to call the pal function. And what pal does is it's a function that changes the palette of colors. And it swaps out, let's say, 9, which is orange, for another color, let's say 12, which is blue. So it changed orange to blue. So now, after that function is called, whenever we would draw orange, we're instead going to draw blue. So let's do, 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 run that, and we can see now the pumpkin is a blue pumpkin. But I don't want to change it to blue, I want to change it to pumpkin color. Do, do, do. So now if I run my code, I'm changing orange to red. And if I ever wanted my pumpkin to be a different color, I could just... Uh, change pumpkin color and it would update Do -do -do. I don't know what 13 is it's a weird blue let's change it to pink now it's pink so now we have a variable that controls what color is displayed which is dope if we keep doing this where we have pumpkin underscore color pumpkin underscore x pumpkin underscore y we're gonna and we keep doing that we're gonna ha end up having a lot of different variables so rather than do that, I want a single variable that is pumpkin. 
what I've done here is instead of having all these variables, we're just going to have one variable pumpkin and we're going to set pumpkin to an object. And an object is much how a function is a storage unit for code and a variable is a storage unit for like one value. An object is kind of like a storage storage for a bunch of different values. So in this case, I've created an object that has an X, a Y, and a color. And if I ever wanted to say like, what is the X value of the pumpkin? You just do pumpkin dot X. So now I only have one variable that I'm working with and I'm going to go through my code and change anywhere to pumpkin underscore to pumpkin dot. So now instead of pumpkin underscore color, we're doing pumpkin dot color. So, and you can see it still works. And this is a much better way of doing it because now I can add on name equals Henry and all sorts of things like that. And then I can use those. So let's, let's actually, let's draw Henry's name. Print pumpkin dot name pumpkin dot x pumpkin is a or print is a function that prints text to the screen let's choose seven which is white henry the pumpkin let's get it off henry there you go there's henry's little name tag and we could change it henrietta and it updates yay congrats henrietta so this is a much better way of doing it because if we wanted to add more values to our pumpkin, we could just kind of like keep putting them on this object instead of creating new variables. So it's a very useful concept. Let's do this. Do create a pumpkin object. I think we've made some good progress. We can handle inputs. We can handle drawing things to the screen. We've got an object. We've got sound effects. I assume that's playing. I don't have my headphones in. So I think I'm going to leave it there. In general, if you uh, miss something there or want some advice or want feedback or critique on anything you've coded or are thinking of coding, you're totally welcome to message me on Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter. Just send me a DM. I'll pretty much always respond. But thanks so much and I'll see you all around.